around the globe, data is everywhere, growing exponentially. Data powers entire businesses. Fueling industries with insights, knowledge, and opportunities. We've been on a mission to help organizations mobilize their data with the Snowflake Data Cloud. Now you can break down silos of data, uniting teams across your business. You can share data with suppliers and partners to drive decisions and tap third-party data instantly to gain new insights and a competitive edge. When you have the full story, you can serve your customers in entirely new ways. The data cloud is redefining your industry, helping realize your company's vision, empowering you to build the future by bringing data together now. Welcome to the third annual Snowflake Summit. It's great to have tens of thousands of business and technical leaders as part of this event. We know your organizations are focused on being data-driven today, and we know that the next two days will inspire you to learn about what is possible with data. Now onto the show and my conversation with Snowflake's chairman and CEO, Frank Slootman. Frank, good to see you, by the way. Yeah, you, you as well, <laughs> Jeffrey. I'm a huge fan yeah, of your, your it's work. It's a pleasure. Yeah. I, you know, we talk a ton about technology adoption and, and how markets transitioned from the early adopters to the mainstream customers. We call it crossing the chasm, as, as you kind of know. Uh, but what kind of crossing the chasm challenges did Snowflake experience early on? And kind of where are we now? I think people would like to know. Yeah, you know, from the outside, it, uh, it has very much looked like uh, the chasm was scarcely a speed bump for, uh, for Snowflake. Uh, but uh, the reality is a little bit different. You know, in the early days, I'm um, going back to, to 2015, we did have, you know, classic crossing the chasm uh, type challenges because large institutions and enterprises, they weren't ready for data in the cloud, right? They were ready for applications in the cloud, but data, that's sort of the final frontier, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the company really resorted to, uh, to use cases like uh, ingesting uh, JSON file semi-structured data, something that we were really, really good at. Um, and also in enterprises like, you know, ad tech and gaming, very, very digitally oriented type of enterprises who weren't afraid of having data in the cloud. So these were classic cross and the chasm type moves, right? You sell where you can and then you sort of generalize and broaden the workloads and the use cases. It is funny, you know, we were talking earlier um, the experience that first crossing the chasm uh, application often is a little bit offbeat. I was remembering way back in when it was SaaS and the IBM mainframe, the crossing the chasm app was actually the charge back algorithms to build the main, mainframe back to the departments. Uh, the other example I would have is, is Hadoop. Like when Hadoop was coming into the enterprise, the, the, the crossing the chasm case was, was ETL. It was just loading the data out of the, uh, onto the analytical platform. Now, neither of those are huge value added apps, but they solved a problem for a particular people that were going, hey, if you can solve this problem, I want in. Yeah, well, ETL and ELT, which is sort of the counterpart to it. I mean, those are still incredibly mainstream uh, operations in data management. There's no way around it, right? The, the data can land on the analytical platform, uh, as you said, but it has to be put in the state where it's analytics ready. There's no way around it. And a lot of the resources and the time and the effort is actually in getting the, re getting the data ready for analytics. So let's, but now I suppose we got it ready. And I'm a business person here. I'm not a technical person in the audience. What are some of the applications where people are going, whoa, Snowflake is changing the game here? Yeah, you know, it, uh, it, it's interesting. There's, there's so much pent up demand for, for analytics because the classic on-premise platforms were extremely constrained in terms of computational capacity, um, you know, you had to back for a 2.30 a.m. slot, you know, most of the time you wouldn't get it and it's a process, maybe you wanted to run it every night, but there was no capacity for it. So maybe you ran it once a month, right? Yeah. So uh, the cloud was obviously a critical enabler uh, for Snowflake, but you also needed an, a software architecture that could really take advantage of the cloud. Uh, you know, a lot of what happened in, in cloud computing really wasn't cloud native. They are really what we call hosted applications, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. There was nothing really cloud about it. Snowflake was though, I and mean, then it doesn't run on premise. It only runs in the cloud and it's, it's a native animal. And as a result, you know, we, we saw people uh, benchmarking their workloads and they still do this day in and day out. They want to see what happens. You know, I, I, I'm, run, I'm running them on-prem, I'm running them on Snowflake. What are the differences? How do you provision these workloads? 
And they, they see things, you know, running orders of magnitude faster. They go from 20 minutes to 20 seconds, right? It's mind blowing. Wow. And, you know, we talk about this concept of the time value of data. Yeah, what that yeah, means yeah, yeah, is, yeah. you know, what can you do with data when you get it in 20 seconds versus 20 minutes versus two days later or three weeks later? Right, it opens up a, a raft of opportunities. You know, I was thinking about that because I was thinking about, you know, when we used to say data back in the day, data was were facts, and they were about your systems of record. Like, how did you, did you make the quarter? You know, did you ship the thing? How many returns, etc. And you looked at them almost like forensically. You looked back at them and you sort of said, okay, well, what did we learn, and can we plan differently in the future? Now we're seeing data as signals. It's like they're, they're, they're giving you clues as to what's happening now or potentially even what's happening in the future. I presume the data cloud applications are having a lot of that uh, focus. Yeah, data is an extremely dynamic, sort of near real-time thing. Like it's continually arriving, it's continually being analyzed for signals, as you said, as, as well as patterns. And what, how can we programmatically act on these signals and take actions, you know, either through a marketing, sales, outreach, uh, change in the experience, um, so that has really changed our, our, our mentality, if you will, in terms of looking at data in arrears. But digital transformation, you know, is really the, the shift from data informing people to data driving operations. Now we talk about this data cloud, you know, everybody cloud this, cloud that. It's it's pretty amorphous. Elaborate on the data cloud. What's really going on there? What's what's different? What what will it take for my organization to get involved with the data cloud? Yeah, you know, just to you know. If we look at cloud over the last uh, 10, 15, even, even 20 years, right? We have built massive infrastructure clouds between Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure uh, and so on. We also have built massive application clouds, you know, the likes of Salesforce, you know, SAP, Workday, ServiceNow, and so on. What happened to data over that period of time? It has become more and more fragmented, siloed, right? Um, we often, we talk about silos, but a lot of people talk about bunkers. Yeah. Uh, and the reason is it's very, very difficult to access. My application owns my data. Yeah, right. So analytics has focused on what we call in silo analytics, right? Yes. We, we, we're running Tableau on top of Salesforce uh, and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. We, we do that all day long. Um, but data science says, look, you know, I, I really don't care that much, you know, about the boundaries that exist between your data sets because the whole essence of data science is to understand data relationships. And those relationships may take you many places, different data sets, different data types. We, we call it data, you know, without boundaries, without frontiers. So let's talk some more about this because, okay, so I, because our thought at one point was data warehouse. Okay, we got lots of data, we'll, we'll just ship it by any way we possibly can get it into one big data warehouse and, 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 we'll, and we'll sort it out. And we know that that was, that was kind of not the most successful thing we've ever tried. But how in the world, if we have all these different data sources, are you getting them to be able to federate or interact with each other so that a data scientist can get at them? You know, this is a, the beautiful thing about cloud, right? Because, you know, you're on, a, on an AWS region and you're essentially living on one giant computer and also one giant database. I mean, the walls are paper thin, you know, between one user and another. You may think you live in your own world, but, you know, you're, the, this is the, the separations machine. are virtual, right? <laughs> exactly. This is the virtual machine all over again. Well, then let's raise it the other way. So now I'll be the chief risk officer. You're going, well, oh, now wait a minute, uh, Frank. What are you doing with my data? So, so I'm sure you've done a lot of work around privacy, governance, et cetera, security. Talk a little bit about that. Because I think that when people hear the word cloud, I, I think they have some anxiety about that. Yeah, and I, I think that uh, that anxiety is, is largely displaced, and, and you're seeing that, right? The adoption of cloud is just nothing short of amazing, right? And you're looking at the quarterly numbers of Microsoft and Amazon, and it's 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 mind blowing. So people are getting over it, uh, and and the thing is, we have to learn new models, right? We, time is not our friend, right? The longer we wait, you know, the more challenging things become, and and technology is is a, is a constant journey of learning and you know sometimes the learning is, is accompanied by you know episodes and events that are that are less than pleasant but we have no choice and uh, you know we actually I think we're, we're doing extremely well uh, the great thing about the security models that live in the cloud is that everybody uses them right yeah. and there's a lot of people that are like everybody's at vaccinated yeah exactly. <laughs> no no so, yeah, 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 yeah that's a very so uh, and that, and instead of everybody running their own little cloud and their own little data center and they have their own little staff to manage, I think there's much more risk, you know, when you think about it in, in running your own on-premise data centers than when you're part of a much larger stack that's much you know, more provisioned 
you know, much more expert at dealing with all the issues, not just security, but also compliance relative to privacy. There are huge issues now, right? Yeah, so. yeah. And in that governance model, I mean, I, I, we used to talk about role-based security in the old days. Is there kind of a role-based security? Okay, if I'm going to share data with another company, because we're collaborating on something, I'm, I have some anxiety. It's like I want to share some data with some people, but I don't want to share all my data with everybody over there. So I assume that there's a bunch of governance protocols that would help manage that part. Yeah, I mean, robust security, I mean, all the things that, that existed in database management platforms, you know, exist on, on cloud data uh, platforms as well. But we now have concepts like data clean rooms. So, you know, for example, if you and I work for separate companies, yeah, you know, and yeah. we do, and we both have data, for example, you know, I'm a media company, you're an advertiser, we have to share data to figure out, you know, what, what you know, what we have in common. You cannot expose me to your data and, and I right. cannot do the same to you, right? Yeah. So how do we do that? Well, we now have data clean rooms, so we can have fully governed sharing uh, of data and the lawyers are happy. Well, it's like <laughs> an M&A like clean room, yeah. but it's, but it's but, exactly. but that, you know, that's a great example of a protocol that we never needed before. That you know, I was thinking about you guys as kind of, I, I, I always want to say the last silo, but we know darn well there'll be another silo we'll find. But you know, in the history that you and I have been in industry, you know, we started with compute with this, and memory, and that was sort of like the Intel and the chip guys. They said, no, we. We, we took care of that for you. And then we said, well, you know, it's the network. You can't, and then Cisco and those guys said, well, okay, we, 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 we kind of took care of that for you. And then, well, it's the, it's the computer, or the, the data set, well, the, the cloud guys have taken that. So data feels like it's kind of the last silo. And, and, um, and so, I, and there's always a company that's associated with breaking down the silos and Snowflake is sort of the word that came to mind. Yeah, yeah data cloud is, uh, is an idea whose time has come. It's something that has to happen uh, because otherwise the promise of data science cannot be realized. And all we're doing is building the silos of the future and that would be pointless. So this is the reason why we tell people, look, don't steer the ship by its wake, right? Yeah. Go look at what the needs are of the future and have an architecture that enables that. What about, so, okay, so we've, we got the data. Now I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to put myself in the mind of somebody going, okay, so what is the next silo? Maybe it's the data scientists. Where do you see the the, the, the data, the, uh, the accessibility of either machine learning or artificial intelligence? I assume that's part, a lot of the use cases would involve that. Is that true? Yeah, it, it is true. Uh, you know, I think machine learning is still one of those topics that everybody has heard about, but very few people really know how to deploy yeah. and employ those techniques. And can they really tell the difference between, you know, analytics and machine learning and, you know, where are the dividing lines and so on? You know, there's, there's still a lot of hysteria around those things and it's kind of caught up in what you said earlier, the Hadoop crowd, yeah. you know, people that love programming and like to use things like data frames and they want to keep using those skills. Yeah. So we get all that. So we have to get you know, sort of regrounded uh, again, get focused again on, okay, you know, how do we drive these signals, these values uh, out of the data, right? I think this notion of a management model that relies on signals and that there's human in the loop but it's not, I mean, the old days, it was trying to make humans smarter. And I, that's a challenge. I mean, you know, <laughs> we have a bandwidth, but it's not that big, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking maybe with this human in the loop, we can get a lot smarter, a lot faster. Yeah, we, you know, we have a, we have a lot of media streaming uh, customers, right? And, um, you know, when, when they look at data, because they, it's a business to consumer, right? So, yeah. So they have no choice but to be highly digital in, in, because otherwise their business will never work, right? They want to get you to sign up for another channel or purchase a movie or whatever Netflix it is. Netflix owns me, yeah, they, they, they know me. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when, when they look at data, they're trying to figure out all the data points, all the patterns, and they come from many different data sets that are going to predict, you know, when you are ready to be presented with an opportunity to sign up for this, that, or, or the other thing. And so it's very, very outcome oriented and outcome yeah. focused. It yeah. lives very, very close to the business process and what the business is supposed to do. These are not sort of arcane infrastructural things, right? Well, so, let's, let's, so now media and entertainment, and by the way, um, some, a lot of people, there are a lot of casualties in that thing, right? Let's go to retail. So all of a sudden, we've all been you know, living at home for the last year and a half. Amazon's business is just like taking over the planet. I'm a retailer. I'm not Amazon. I feel like I need your signal detection capability. Are you seeing action in the retail world? Yeah, obviously, uh, retail is is going massively, you know, digital as well, right? The, the likes of Instacart, you know, of course, the the, the pandemic has, has rocked that that business, but the same thing with DoorDash, 
know, Uber Eats uh, and so on. And it's largely dis uh, digital how they're operating. And they're layering a digital experience on top of an analog experience, you know, and that's, that's somewhat uncomfortable, of course. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's driven, you know, by digital. So that means it's driven by data, right? I mean, they, they can predict, you know, based on your historical patterns and, and, and so on, you know, what you're going to want to have for dinner tonight. <laughs> well, you know, this is because I, I remember retail is like the store manager. The, the, well, the, the merchandising manager would load up the store and then the store manager had to unload the store, right? Well, now we're both of them are going to have to learn it's a digital world. And there's a human in the loop way of playing that world that they're not used to. So um, I, again, I think it's I think it's back to crossing the chasm in vertical. As we're thinking about vertical markets, are there some vertical? I mean, you said media and entertainment, and I kind of get that. Is there any other vertical that's kind of you think was moving particularly quickly with this um, these applications? Yeah, we we've had the, the, the very very leading edge, uh, born in the cloud, born digital uh, type of enterprises. Uh, they're very, they're very comfortable managing consumption versus capacity and so on. And then there are institutions that are, are they are more the laggards, you know, in the terminology of crossing the, the chasm. And, uh, you know, we obviously have to meet people where they are and bring them, take them on the journey. Yeah. You know, I've talked to enterprises, you know, data science is like, what does that mean? What do these people look like? Right. So in other words, uh, you know, we're very much at the front end of the early adopters. Uh, the people that are strategic, visionary, kind of the in front of the chasm yeah, you know, yeah. type of people. Well, maybe like in healthcare um, or some. I mean, I think the pandemic, obviously, great. We talk about somebody that needs data in the cloud. The world needs data. In yeah, the cloud. a very good example is we had on our Snowflake data marketplace a, uh, a data set uh, by a company called Star Schema. Um, what they had was very, very detailed, you know, near real, real time incident of fatality data on, on COVID. Now we thought, okay, you know, public health people are going to be using that, and, and other healthcare institutions, and so on. The reality was, almost everybody in our customer base was accessing that data. Why? Because they're trying to predict demand. They're using it to drive their supply chains, uh, and so on. So these things are far more pervasive, you know, across verticals than we had understood or realized in the beginning. So you know, you and I, as we've seen technology innovation after innovation. Financial services has often been an early adopter, maybe because it's largely a digital, it's like media, it's sort of a digital world, right? Yep. But, but in financial services, anything particular, um, any applications kind of catching up with you there? If media is our, our, our single largest uh, vertical, uh, you know, large, big finance is, is, is not far behind. So we've had a lot of early adoption uh, in, in banking as well as in insurance. And then again, it's, it's very closely related to the business. I remember when we first started talking to some large insurance companies, you know, it was not about architecture and cloud. They said, look, you know, we, we had a higher set of claims in Florida for bodily injury this quarter. Why is that? Yeah. Right. So in other words, these are very, very pointed, very industry specific questions that the data, you know, needs to respond to. Right. So uh, that's the reason why they need data. Yeah. Right? Because yeah, yeah. how do you understand uh, your business? Uh, you know, the, the big shift is that, you know, we used to perceive our business just through anecdotal uh, observation, yeah. right? I mean, you, you read the paper, yeah. you consume the news, you talk to people, and, but, but you know, basically things were more or less the same day to day. Then came COVID, massive dislocation. You can't possibly understand the world through anecdotal observation no, anymore. You can't. Now yeah. we need data. Yeah, and it's every time it showed. I mean, I can remember, I can remember being at a conference not very long ago. It was maybe five years ago, where we were talking about what computers would do and displacing human beings. Well, a computer would never drive a car. Yeah, that, <laughs> and so it's like, okay, this is this is this is a new this is a new world. Well, any last thoughts in terms of like, look, you know, um, it's it's architecturally very very exciting. Uh, uh, kind of like how, I'm trying to imagine like how would I get started or how would I lean in a little bit here? What's kind of a next step if I say yes, it really sounds good. I got it, but we've not thought about it a lot in my company. How would you how would you advise somebody at this conference to proceed? You know the. Uh, the good thing is that you know a lot of what we do in the in the early stages with customers is what we refer to as modernization. It's not transformation. And the transformation is like, look, I want to do things I've never done before, right? Modernization is like, look, you know, I live on these platforms and I want to give myself the opportunity to do transformational things. But step one is I got to get to the cloud. I got to get the data to the cloud. I got to migrate to databases, right? And I got to get get things running properly in the cloud. I get the same results there that I was getting on my on-premise systems. Those are not minor things, right? Yes. So we gotta we gotta traverse that journey 
first, right, before we sort of set our sights on more ambitious goals. So interesting, because if you were born in a cloud, then maybe your data was already in the cloud. Right. But if you're hybrid, if you're coming out of data centers, going to the cloud, big, big problem. Yeah. I, I, I get that. But, but, but as you say, if we're going to get these signals, we, we, this, the, the data, the signals are hiding in the noise, right? We got oh, yeah. to get the data together to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, but we, uh, we got to lay the foundations, you know, for being able to, not just in systems, but also in skill sets, right? I mean, in other words, and this is, data is, is becoming the beating heart of the modern enterprise, the digital enterprise, right? It's, it's, it's not just throwing a switch and now we're there. No, I mean, the, the jobs of the future are the data scientists that run and instrument these systems. Now, you know, it's interesting, you said something that, there was a while back where we were seeing this title, job title called Chief Data Officer. What is your take on that? Chief Data Officers are, is, a, is a core constituency and a core audience. And oftentimes they were peeled out of the IT organization and reporting directly up to a CEO or a CEO. Um, so we've seen a lot of proliferation of titles, right? There yeah. used to be the CIO and everything. Yeah. Now you have Chief D Digital Officer, Chief Transformation Officer, Chief Data Officer. Gotcha. So and it's gotcha. all kind of a, a first, it's born from a frustration, like this is not going fast enough. This is not going where I yeah. want it to be. And you know, IT has always been very infrastructure oriented. Yes. This is not infrastructure oriented yeah. per se, yes. right? We're aiming for specific outcomes. Yes. The chief data officers, uh, they're alive and well. Are and, they? Okay, you know, okay, that's yeah. really good. I want to thank Frank now for an engaging discussion about the intersection of technology and business. It's clear that Snowflake is bringing the world's data together to deliver on a promise of making organizations data-driven. Now I'm going to pass it along to Benoit Dageville, Snowflake's co-founder and president of products, to talk more about the Snowflake Data Cloud.